Okay, let's start the afternoon session. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce the final two speakers for today. The first one is uh, Wolfgang Hanke, uh, Mr. Blenner Lippel Weilias, uh, and he will give us a, in the first part of his talk a little bit of a historic background on the on the topic, and then in the second part we'll talk about spreading depression. Um, it's it, yes, that's right, you said, yes, I'm sorry, yes, um, thank you Wolfgang for being here, so, okay. stage is yours. Uh, why is this statement to talk about one of the violence? I think most of you will know what's going ahead with that, but when you really think about what one of the violence means, then you might see that this, technically this technique belongs to the core of that what is presented here, because a lot of experiments and a lot of findings we have been got to, to learn here would not have been possible with such things like, like the pet pet technique or so. So I think it's worth to just to remember that Plana Pilipi I think simply belong to the scene. That's point one. And the other thing uh, for me that belongs also a bit to the history. Uh, okay, to be fair, it would be fairer that Connie would give this talk about history, but there is a problem. I hope I can finish in two or twenty minutes. I think we think we would have no chance in twenty hours. <laughs> Okay, let's, so what I wanted to do is just two or three technical remarks. As you see here, I will tell you a few short words about advantages of this technology. I will go a little bit through the historical things, more or less to point out why we are sitting here. And then I want to specify a little bit more a historical story to this, what is called on my side, Alamessesin as a center of management properties. And finally, I will present two or three additional things and ask some new things to be done. Uh, technologically, it's so, uh, when you look into the history of Bayer techniques, uh, the oldest and the first thing which has been done was the so-called Müller-Rudi technique, better known as black lipid membrane. And just to remind you, this black lipid membrane was really true according to the fact that these membranes have been painted from a decaying solution, and uh, then uh, when the decay was going to the side, to the septum holding the bilayer, the area of the bilayer in reflected light, uh, light becomes black. And that is this historical statement, black lipid membrane. Meanwhile, it's so, okay, here's, here's a little, just a remark how it was measured. You have here the bilayer, you illuminate that, and look at that thing in reflected light. And when you see that it's uh, this decay, it has about the thickness and the shell of it. So bubbles, so you have these wonderful colors when you look in white light, and when you have the very thin membrane, you have double reflection, once with and once without phase jump, and you have uh, el uh, <coughs> elimination, and so you have the black lipid membrane. Well, this technique is quite old, it can be performed very easily. Another advantage of the technique, uh, what you need is just not very much, I think, uh, even a moderately good workshop can do that for you, what you need. In so far, but, what came out is that, of course, every technique has a few shortcuts. So this old Müller Woody technique, for example, we have just learned in another talk the other day that, for example, this decay in the membrane, which was used all the time, has a slight problem that it changes or that it shifts the phase transition of the lipid. And indeed, for a reasonable time in history, people tried to get rid of this decay and wanted to construct so-called solvent-free bilayers. That was one of the aspects. Uh, so, for example, uh, this folding technology here is belonging to this attempt, and then this uh, technology, this dip, uh, the so-called dipstick, dipstick technology using pesh pipettes. Uh, so, a, a few attempts have been made, and it was de facto quite successful. So, meanwhile, it's indeed possible to make bilayers which are, you know, let's say, close to the plain lipid membranes. And finally, what came also in fashion to do so-called supported bilayers which was another attempt, for example, uh, to get bigger areas and so, but on that point I was amazed the other day when I was told about this bilayer 10 centimeters long and 200 microns wide, chapeau. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, what is the advantages of such a system? The lipid composition can be freely defined, so uh, in the, uh, just comparing to patch time technique and the patch time technique, you always have this problem. Highly complicated composition, lots of lipids, lots of proteins. Here, you can do what you want. You have access to the lipid composition. You can uh, use lipids with or without charge, with or without right people. You can use or even esoteric lipids. Uh, you can make symmetric membranes, but you can make also clearly acid membrane, asymmetric membranes, possibly even going to the point having one fluid and one gel-like side in the monolayers. 
you have easy access to the aqua solutions in the system. You have, of course, a free choice of the aqua solution itself. Also, you can easily incorporate <coughs> substances into the system. You can, what is very important, I will come later to that shortly, include in the bilayer so-called, I call it functional molecules, better known reconstitution of ion channels, but I try to avoid that a bit here. <coughs> and you can uh, have a better access theoretically to what is happening in the system because it's de facto the most easy biophysical system, the most easy model of a real membrane. Now a few uh, comments to the history. Uh, indeed, it started very early in the 60s, and when you look at this here, uh, by Müller and Müller and Udi here, it's one of the first experiments where they created a membrane which has a which has a certain uh, permeability just to ions. It's this old story here. Uh, <coughs> they used a specific system to say it was induced an excitable uh, an excitability. It was this so-called I. EIM, and what they only, what, only what they could show, you can make these membranes, and in these membranes you can induce some conductance. That's it. Then later, Müller and Rudin, but others too, for example in 68, but there have other been, uh, been other attempts too, have shown such things as here. Here they incorporated alamethacine at a very high concentration that is necessary, plus again a negatively charged poly uh, polypeptide, and they indeed were uh, to create something which, according to as it looks like, is not that far away from what is called an action potential. Uh, according to the mechanisms we are talking about, it's completely different. It has nothing to do with sodium channels or so. It's just alamethacine and what I said, a negatively charged polypeptide. But the time cost and the optical, uh, the, the current cost is not that far away from real action potential, 68. Then, this is interesting, I think it's not the first recording, but it's one of the first papers talking about discrete steps in conductance. Uh, you also can say the first ion channel or the first pore. And de facto, this was before the patch clamp technology. Uh, this is the one, the, the, it's, it's always, a lot of people have in mind that ion channels or pores have been verified just by the patch clamp technique. Not true. In bilayer experiments, at least people were, they were a little bit more care careful. They were talking about discrete conducted steps. Uh, there are better recordings, but this belongs surely to the history of the scenery. Now, okay, this you should know. This is one of the reasons why we sit here. And the guy who is responsible for that, besides that, is this guy over there, who forced me at that time to sit together with him at the Bailey set up and be a pain in the neck for my boss. Not for him, but for my boss. <laughs> and so the consequence was that with these findings, it was obvious that we have what, at that time I call ion lipid channels or pores in plain lipid membranes, others called the ion channels, so whatever, but it was the dem first, one of the first demonstrations that under certain conditions you have discrete conducted steps in plain lipid membranes. <coughs> De facto, this is what I want to point out now in a parallel way, around the same time things were on the market like this here. People were working with what they call electroporation or electropores uh, in the 80s, same time. And they were just doing identical things what we did, they just called it differently, they called it electropores. When you later look, in here is a review about the models they presented about what these conductances, these electropores are. I don't see a difference between this model and the model of ion channels in Thomas' work, for example. So, what happened obviously is that there were two branches of scientists, the one talking about biologically related things, they got the problems and the guys who talk about electropores and technical things, they were ignored. Okay, then in this field of electropores, even now a lot of people are on their way, but they are still using this terminology, what I don't understand, but okay, it simply belongs to the history, but indeed they have even shown that you can combine electrical and optical measurements now, <laughs> so it might be interesting to put these two branches together in, for other things, which would uh, really be interesting for me to see how these people get, would get around with each other. And a, a few people have, which have been working with this field, for example, Eva Neumann from Berlin, uh, from, sorry, from Bielefeld, he was very successful indeed in the field. Okay, so far to these historical stories. What then came was the other aspect. Uh, According to some rumors, let's say this way in the literature at that time, again my boss forced me to do some very shitty experiments. There was a question, can you make a frozen bilayer? And a lot of people were simply stating no. Okay, 
of course we could, otherwise we would not stand here with these results. And this is this, one of the first recordings in this paper where we were able to show first, very roughly, because the recording technique at that time, sorry, was not that good. But we could show when you go through the phase transition, you have increased fluctuations from that. The capacity of the bilayer changes when you go to the phase transition, meaning when the membrane is thinner in the fluid state, the capacity is higher. And then in addition, of course, because that was not what I wanted, but what my boss wanted, to demonstrate the effects of these uh, effects on uh, transport mechanisms. So the first thing we did, we incorporated a carrier molecule, not a channel of or whatever, but a classical carrier molecule, malinomycin, mal 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 a potassium carrier, and we could demonstrate that the transport mediated by a carrier molecule simply breaks down when it goes to the, pre uh, to the gel state. It was a little bit different when doing the same experiments with gramicidin and alamacetin. Uh, we never did it at that time with classical ions, but we did it on principal reasons with gramicidin and alamacetin. And then you see when you go through the phase transition from the hot side uh, that you have this increase in uh, <coughs> permeability. And it's somewhere where the phase transition of this lipid is, but it's much broader. And what we discussed at that time was that it's simply an effect that in the uh, in intermediate region, alamacetin is demixing in the fluid phase. That also explains this increase here in amplitude. So basically, what we found there, I think, was quite consistent. So meaning, it was demonstrated, first, you can do a prose bilayer. Second, transport properties mediated by carriers break down. Third, there is some things with lipid, uh, with, with, with pores and channels. And the question which is still open now is, has ever someone been showing that there will be pores or open states of pores in the frozen state? There are a few very rare measurements in lab protocols. In case someone is interested, I will comment later on that. Okay, but to be fair, there is this guy, Antonov, um, Günther Wohlheim, also my, my boss and me knew very well at that time, who also was involved in this business, and he was also one of the first to show in this case uh, discrete conducted steps in, in this phase transition area. So meaning in the 80s, I think the basis was, was already there to understand, not to understand, but to know what could come. Uh, okay, then came the decades of ion channel reconstitution. No way out. So me, myself and others reconstituted about every channel we could get. One later every channel we could purify. As an example, at the Tulkola receptor, these traces are a gift, a recording from Bert Sackmann. It's published later, but it's, he, he, offered, uh, he gave that to me uh, to have a control in my PhD thesis, funny enough. And this is a reference traces uh, in the bilayer of the reconstituted at the Tulkola receptor. Just to say uh, whatever the mechanisms behind are, this is not what I wanted to discuss. I want just to say at that time we started first with more or less uh, not purified proteins, but there was this phase when you took membranes rich in certain proteins, for example, rich in acetylcholine receptor, or you put membranes rich in chloride channels, and later come the purification decades. And so this is one of the, not historical, but one of the older things, how it has been done. The citations you have here. Okay, and then, a little bit later, even, uh, but even years ago, and we have already seen this figure by Florian's uh, comment, uh, even at that earlier times, people were already discussing, of course, that membrane conductances induced by proteins, of course, are lipid dependent, that they are not standing for themselves, but as given here, uh, you can say generalized polarization, which is basically fluidity, is modifying the properties of the acetylcholine receptor, as well as conductance, as well as uh, open state probability and kinetics. Okay, next example, reconstitution of the sodium channel. Interesting aspect, it was never really ex successful. It was possible uh, to do that in patch lab experiments, uh, there you have a whole bunch, uh, as much as you want, but in bilas, I think, as far as I remember, uh, the sodium channel was never reconstituted in full activity. Uh, we were able at that time to reconstitute it according to the gross behavior, but the time constants were wrong compared between bilayers 
and batch plan experiments. This shows you that even with all these given things, there were a few problems in the history, and especially this problem here, that very often time constants and bias and in batch time experiments were different, that was about typically. It was not only with the sodium channel. And the other aspect I will not show here, but is also very typical, when doing pharmacology, usually pharmacology at bilayers is much more nasty than with uh, real cell membranes. Usually the concentration of the drugs to be needed are higher than in patch time experiments. Okay, so, so, so about this reconstitution business, and I think that was, how to say, in for at least 20 years. Meanwhile, we were more or less quit with the scenery. The reconstitution on the left, where was that done? What? The, the, the pictures on the left, where they were successful in reconstitution? No, no, this is not here. That is uh, all that are in, 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 in uh, patch clamp experiments. Uh, on, on real cells? Yeah. Oh, okay. So this is patch clamp as a reference, and that is bilayers. Uh, that is uh, figures from my habilitation, because I, I know that there is no... With the sodium channel, there is really a slight problem in reconstitution experiments. Okay, and now coming to one of the other things I wanted to shortly report about. Historically, alambecine is a substance uh, which is deeply involved in the history of bilayers. It's a poor-forming polypeptide called Trichoderma viride, and it is known, uh, it is a peptide, as a polypeptide as given here in the structure, so nothing very specific. And the model of this pore is very specific. What makes this interesting, I will shortly comment in a moment. The idea is that each molecule forms something like an alpha helical thing. The alpha helix is a little bit tilted at one of these things, and then the pore, in this case not an iron, the, the pore is formed by this so-called barrel staff model created mainly by Mutabuan. This barrel staff model says you have uh, pores which are made of different numbers of monomeric helices, and uh, the pores can shift between states by just adding or taking out one or more of these helices. So you have uh, something like a pore with variable diameter, and from that you can calculate when you know a bit about the molecule, uh, what there should be the conductances, and de facto this fits very well. The other thing what is for me very interesting is um, this model, when you have a deeper look at it and uh, try to understand it, should be very much depending on the lipid core, the meaning of the thermodynamics of the membrane. Because to remove in and out alpha helices will by sure depend on the phase state of the membrane there. It will be depending on what we call fluidity and such things. So uh, that, I just want shortly to show one or two things. First, it's easily to be shown, in this case in monolayer measurements, that the incorporation of these alamedicine molecules into the bilayer are strictly depending on the starting conditions, meaning this is simply three different monolayer recordings with different starting pressure. And you see very clearly a steep dependence of the incorporation rate of analysis into the monolayer. Second, since you have already had, uh, one of these experiments Conniff forced me to do, and I would never uh, advise anyone to repeat it. It's really no fun, but it worked. When you increase lateral pressure in the bilayer, alamecesin uh, activity increases. Uh, using another technical approach, uh, Opsal and Bet showed the, the same thing uh, a little bit, even a little better uh, later, but it's more or less the same finding. And this is what uh, Florian showed just in the last talk, the bilayer measurements, or better the alamecesin measurements in, in, uh, in under gravitational changes indicates the same thing. So just saying activity of alamecesin in, uh, increases at higher gravity. And higher gravity in our terminology was connected uh, also, for example, remember, fluidity decreases in microgravity, uh, uh, fluidity increases in microgravity and decreases in hypergravity. So that would be consistent here. Okay, then, just finally, one further experiment, which is also quite funny. When you induce in a bilayer by high potential, high potential means 100, 120 millivolts or so, current fluctuations, and go with this bilayer, again, to gravity experiments, you see, that the density of this fluctuation, the overall integrated density of this fluctuation is gravity dependent. Other way around, it's fluidity dependent. Okay. Finally, some problems which I want to leave you with. So, uh, channel fluctuations in, uh, in frozen membranes, whatever that means. There is some evidence that, for example, the alamecesine pore, when it's frozen, stays open forever. It does not fluctuate any longer, but it's a very weak evidence, so I don't show it. 
But meaning these so-called channels have to actually the frozen membranes or mycin would be interesting. Of course, still the old problem, even here. Look, these are these things you everyone knows here. Uh, but I think what is also not that trivial is the selectivity or uh, selectivity of trans uh, transport via lipid ion channels. That is a thing which should be considered a little bit more deeply. Then you have this story with the extended bilia in area. In area, it's still open. Uh, but I think in, in, in axon like structures we just had it as a talk, what I talk, what I said. Uh, so, another uh, problem now focusing on action potentials. Single sodium channels within some limits have been reconstituted. Uh, PS from constitu reconstituted shown have not really been shown to be possibly relevant. I say not really because when you take out this problem with the time constant, we could talk about that. Then this experiment or this statement uh, that you can sum up single channel events to construct the global current, this is that uh, uh, this st statistical model, uh, is still questionable in my eyes. Okay, and finally, uh, 1 and D propagating RPs in bilayers, about 1D, we had this nice thing, so best wishes to, to do it. And finally, this so-called artificial axon, also we had that yesterday. Okay, now so far so good. Now I want to be a bit nasty. Uh, finally, I found a few interesting things. When you just leave the field of vertebrates and go to so-called hyperthermophiles, to experiment with bacteria or archaea, you suddenly find that you have very strange lipids. Just take these two here. These lipids make very nice membranes. And I, find even, I found even a paper citing that you have fluctuations in this, current fluctuations in email. And I have a problem. This will not work. So, good luck. <laughs> yeah, how can you um, fold that so that this will give a poor? It, it, this needs a little bit more complicated models, I say. You can just change to each other in that drawing. You will have to explain that to me very much in detail. But, <laughs> okay? But I think it's an interesting approach. But what I want to po point out is these lipid membranes made from these molecules have a few very specific things. For example, uh, you have these so-called hyperthermophiles or other, other things. Uh, you have membranes which have at the outer side a pH of 1 or even a bit less. And inside the cell you have a pH around 7, 6.5 or so. And these membranes, on this reason, must be absolutely proton tight. Also a problem. They are proton tight, and this is different to classical membranes. So I think it would be interesting. In case I would not retire, by sure I would start with the lipids to work. Okay. So far so good. That's about the history and about violence. Now let's come to the second point which I decided to talk about here and which is a totally different, or which seems to be a totally different story. You see, it's a beginning when we have started and a lot of people did that we have been talking about action potentials. But later on we decided in my group and in other groups too better to talk about wave propagation in excitable media. This is a story which is a much more extended range and when you talk about excitable media and wave propagation, you find a lot of more interesting things. For example, spreading depression waves in retina, spreading in the cortex. We are going to talk about that in very much detail tomorrow morning. But also you find things like the so-called Belozov-Sabotinsky reaction, which is a chemical reaction. So, in case you want to say so, it has nothing to do with biology. But when you look at the physics and the behavior of all these different systems, they have some striking similarities. So uh, you can learn a lot about even action potential, for example, from this Belozov-Sapotinsky reaction. And this is why I want to present that to people here, because I'm quite sure that a lot of people may know it in basics, but not the details. So what is behind? The first is what is a so-called excitable system. There is not one statement and not one formulation what that means, but there is some. The one is here from the literature. These are more or less the prerequisites of that. This is what, what is necessary to, to, uh, to define a so-called excitable system. You see a well-defined steady state, a threshold, an excitation. When you go through this, it should be very well known to you from the actual potential mainly. 
And what is of course true, such systems do exist everywhere around, from physics to medicine, or even to social systems and so on. So, um, nevertheless, one can go a little bit more pragmatic and go the other way around, and say I can also go this way. I have this other definition. Um, it, it's not different, but it points out a few things more clearly. You have here the thermodynamical approach, and what is even more important for me, you have here the statement that these excitable media in general express a few things, oscillations, propagating wave pattern, pattern formation and self-organization. And also very important, the behavior of these media is critically depending on small external forces. For us important, gravity. Because, but gravity is just one. I remember deep discussions in the field about people saying the small electromagnetic field of the handy under these conditions might be relevant. So, when you take that serious, please, throw away your handy. Okay, these two guys are the, the boss which are more or less did it, Belusov and Zamotinsky. The history about is a bit shitty. In 1951, Belusov uh, did experiments more or less to have a model of the Krebs cycle. He tried to publish it when he found in a beaker he uh, produced uh, oscillating color between, at that time, uh, slight yellow and colorless. Uh, so he found it, and he said this must be, of course, uh, uh, the optical result of a fluctuating chemical reaction. And of course what happened is written here, uh, at that time, uh, thermodynamically open systems were not accepted, and so the editor said goodbye, this is an artifact. Uh, this is not such a rare event, uh, after all, in, in, in publication history. Later on, in, 70, in, in, 64, in, in, uh, in 64, Zamotinsky was able to publish that, and that had become very famous because that was the time also when Prigodin and others entered the field, and the theory was open then. And now it's, I think, maybe the best understood and the best studied model system in the field. So what's going ahead here? This thing is very, very simple. Uh, you put together a few chemicals, create an important homogeneous chemical solution, stir it vigorously, and optically you will see it changes color. In this case, according to the chemistry we used, from red to blue, and then back and it oscillates, typically on a time scale, let's say over a minute or so, under standard lab conditions. Um, this cannot be explained when you look at the involved chemicals by a simple reaction. Impossible. Everybody <coughs> immediately could see that you will not have uh, oscillations. So the consequence was that obviously what had to be done was to say we must have reactions with intermediates and we must only, not only have one reaction but more than one and in, within these different in, uh, re uh, reaction steps the intermediates must be present in different equations. And that meant a lot of reaction schemes came up. One of the classical reaction schemes is this, uh, which is not very sophisticated with a few reactions, and when you go in detail through this, what is written down there, you will find a few compounds being in the one or the other equation present. And what you can do, this is trivial now, at that time it was not so trivial, you can put that on a computer, run a simulation on MATLAB or Zimulink, and then come back in a short minute to that, and then you can easily perform uh, and demonstrate that such reaction indeed delivers such fluctuations. That's not the problem. What is behind? The chemistry behind is absolutely trivial. Sorry, that is. You have just a thing what is, has to be. Uh, you need a, 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 a probable organic uh, thing, what can, which is written here. Uh, as I said, Belusa uh, started with uh, <coughs> citron acid. You need a potassium bromide. You need a, 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 <coughs> a redox or something like a system. And, and, and you need acid environment. And what, uh, what Belusov did, he mainly followed this line here. Uh, when you do that, uh, the color change is between uh, colorless and light yellow. It's a little bit difficult to see. Uh, what people later on recognized is when you use a catalyst system like the intervene <coughs> system, that changes the color change to this red-blue story that I showed you. And so the basic reason behind it at the beginning to use this catalyst system was just that it was better optically to, to measure. And okay, just when you see down here, you print in the lab, you prepare these solutions, put them together in a sufficient amount, stir them, and that's it. Uh, this is a ferroid story here, so instead of using sea in this state here, you add ferroid here, and then you have instead yellow, colorless, you have red, blue. That's all. Now, when you have such a beaker now, 
Um, what is easy is you can take a blue LED and a photomultiplier or even a simple photodetector because you have enough light. Uh, then you see a scheme more like this. Anytime when the system goes from red to blue, you have this increase in transmission through the beaker. And what is interesting in this field, this is why we usually do that with blue light. The transition from red to blue is fast and the transition from blue back to red again is slow. That's something like the refractory period. And what you also see is when you have a beaker with a limited amount of material, the fluctuation goes down a bit. And when I would have a recording which would be much longer than that, it would be go often further down. And more important also, the oscillation frequency goes down. What is very important also, obviously, this oscillation and later wave propagation in this system is clearly using energy. It's not adiabatic or something like that. It's really consuming energy. Okay, then you can you may have a look at a single peak of this thing. These peaks have a detailed structure in time, which has to do with the uh, catalyst systems to be used and with the global composition. And so these peaks also tell you a bit about how the reaction is running on. So you see here in the time scale that the peaks uh, at the beginning typically have this double peak behavior. Funny comment in between, when you compare that to the optical profile of a spreading depression, it's about identical. Okay. Uh, just as a control to demonstrate that everything is fine, then when you heat the system, oscillation frequency goes up. Just uh, This is a measurement uh, of a lab course of, uh, uh, of our students in, in, in Hohenheim. Then, what is more interesting now is another story, uh, which was uh, again one of these things in the history of uh, publication things. Uh, what you can do is when you have these systems, when you have the chemical equations and when you do the, when you recalculate that in differential equations, you can calculate the so-called dispersion reaction of the system. The dispersion reaction is nothing else than the uh, dependency of the propagating velocity of waves uh, in a system with dispersion. And typically it's so uh, that when you have an os when, when the frequency goes higher, uh, or other way around, when the frequency goes lower, that means when the period goes lower, then it's better to understand, then the system approaches a constant final velocity. It's more or less the same with the actual potential. That's more or less when you have an actual potential running in the refractory period of the previous actual potential. Typically, in all things, it was said, uh, the whole dispersion reaction does not exist. It only exists this so-called positive branch or this upper branch. And this here would the cut be, be the cut of, of the absolute refractoriness. And important now, uh, what has been calculated here for the BZ reaction, you can really calculate identical form action potential using what's been aptly terminology. Interestingly, um, my people and we were able uh, to produce also this lower branch of the dispersion relation. And that creates a few nice ideas. <laughs> because then, when you have just a look at two waves, the first and the second wave, the second wave is faster the closer it comes to the first wave and that will lead finally so to so-called uh, front-to-back collisions. That means the second wave runs from behind in the first wave. Interesting aspect. Usually I've looked at that this is in a, uh, also causes annihilation but there are still a few questions with it open and interestingly what I said this should be possibly uh, the same behavior in action potential. As far as I know no one really has, put, has been able to show both branches experimentally in action potential. <clears throat> okay, then we did some experiments which are just to, to, for fun and to demonstrate that it has something to do with biology. In biology, for example, it's very well known that exchanging normal water to heavy water systems become slower and less excitable. This is just what is shown here. Normal water, heavy water, and you see clearly excitability and uh, activity of the system goes down a lot. This would be the fluctuations in the beaker. When you have a look at now propagating waves in, in two-dimensional system, that is nothing than a thin layer of fluid, more or less the same idea. In these fluids you have these typical waves, I hope you can see it. Uh, with normal water you have ex real propagating waves. I will show better photos later. With, DO2, uh, with D2O, uh, uh, the, the system is much less excitable. You have not really waves, you have just fragments of waves and they are propagating slowly. So this just demonstrates to you that D2O doesn't present the same as it does in, uh, in, in uh, biological systems. Okay, this is how it, as, what it looks like in a little bit better photo. So these typical waves, in the thin layers of fluid in a petri dish, for example. 
Uh, of course, you can make a series of photos. What happens very often when you put such a thing there, of do it in a petri dish, you see still one of, the, of these global changes from red to blue here, and then suddenly at certain spots these waves start to propagate. Why they start, they, or whether they start, and how often they start, depends on the excitability of the system and whether you have disturbances, for example, a dust or something like that. So, so this can be controlled in a certain way. And then uh, another to show that these things are really depending now uh, on, on electrical and magnetic field, I just want shortly to show even with these propagating waves, you get that profiles now at the wave front. Interestingly, at, uh, you have the same, more or less the same profiles on the wave front and in the uh, oscillating systems, and you see that these things are depending on DC magnetic fields and on IC magnetic fields. But more or less the story of small uh, external forces. Uh, what is more interesting now, and I asked Florian not to tell about that because uh, he had enough to do with biology, uh, that is now uh, below Zasabotinsky in microgravity. And what you see is uh, that the propagation velocity of the system is clearly depending now the other way around uh, on, on gravity. In this case it can be even calculated because when you involve diffusion in such a system, and it's a diffusion reaction system, uh, diffusion, uh, diffusion uh, uh, equations, a gravitational term can be added and then it, it's okay. Uh, in this system also you can of course now uh, look at collisions. Here is such a typical example, two spirals are rotating, but what you see here, when the clear thing is that you have collisions here, and what is at this figure also very clear that this could be, at this experiment collisions clearly annihilate. But it means that you can do a few other things. The first thing is you can work, for example, with fragments in a two-dimensional system. Uh, this is not really talking about not annihilating waves, but what happens then is when these waves match here, you see they are, how to say, escaping into the, to the, in, in, into the perpendicular direction. So it's not violating uh, the statement of annihilation, but it already is, is, shows that you can do interesting experiments. And what I found then, and a lot of people did that, first theoretically, people demonstrated under the conditions given here, uh, in BZ, there should be collisions without annihilation. Uh, of course you can apply the same theory again to action potentials, and there should be necessarily work too. And indeed, someone was able to demonstrate that. This is a shitty demonstration, I think, but I did not find better things. I will come later to that. This is a so-called st stacking technology of two meeting waves, and that they do not disappear here demonstrates that you have no annihilation. And, that, and there are more papers in the literature, I mean, by clearly stating under certain conditions in BZ, waves can collide without annihilation. Not. Okay, now another story going back to this oscillating thing. Uh, this oscillating thing, I want to point one more uh, point. There is no convection in the system, there is no buoyancy, and as you stir it vigorously, you can state that possibly diffusion doesn't play an important role. Then you bring this system in a system of uh, fluctuating gravity, in a uh, parabolic flight system. And the parabolic flight gravity profile is about like a fluctuating system with a minute time scale. And then you bring in the, that the BZ reaction, and what unfortunately happens then is that the soy nasty BZ reaction synchronizes, synchronizes with the period of the, uh, of the gravity fluctuation. And this is up to now open why that happens. I have no idea, so I will be happy in case someone explained to me, because everyone from physics told me this is just not, not a good idea to present it. But the problem here is a very general problem. So just first take it as a fact. It has been proven a few times. It can be in theoretically discussion, so in model system, in modeling experiments with Model, uh, it can be done using more or less this uh, Originator model, but this Originator model, we just have discussed it with me, this has a few shortcuts. It has only concentrations and rate constants and ignores all other physical parameters. So there might be a few problems with that, uh, because when you just take these equations here, uh, then necessarily rate constants would be gravity dependent, and this is not a good idea. And this is why I say, uh, this is one of the classical things. The theoretical thing is so that one of the models is the so-called Originator model. The equations are here. 
uh, here is a written what that means. Uh, and when you look at these equations, they can easily be called, compared to Hodgkin Huxley. It's more or less the same thing. And de facto, what a lot of people also do is they approach the approach of story with the fitz hubner uh, uh, theory, which also, as we just listened to that the other days, is very frequently, uh, very frequently used also in uh, actual potential description. So these systems have a few theoretical things which are very common. <coughs> Okay, now coming to just two final statements. This system of the BZ nevertheless allows you a few things I think you cannot do with actual potentials of membranes. One idea is you make a small capillary that can be as long as you want, and then you produce a system which in these reservoirs here create waves, and then you can really create very nicely front-to-front -front collisions. And then you can investigate the system and see whether they end in or not. And second, a few more statements. You can make waves, or you can have waves in one, two, and three dimensions. All these things are technical, not trivial, but they are possible. You can have waves on curved surfaces, also not, problem, not a problem. And please have in mind when talking about actual potentials in the brain, the brain is by sure not a flat geometry. It's by sure highly curved. And it, uh, we just discussed that the other day, that possibly, and this theoretically is anyhow okay, uh, that waves propagating differently on curved surfaces have a plane geometries. You can do long-lasting experiments, close to equilibrium or not, in so-called continuously stirred reactors. You can investigate in something like the excitability of the system. And you can do what is also interesting, and that is the only spreading depression photo I show, because this was never successful in uh, BZ experiments, but I think it should work too. The idea behind is the following. You have a two-dimensional system. In this stacking uh, presentation, the stimulus is done here, the wave appears a long period later at a very much different place. That means the stimulus is at one place and the wave setup is at another place and it's later, with a latency. Interesting aspect, because how is that to explain? Okay, with that I want to close. Good luck. <laughs>
so that has to be proven identically now, whether you can get identical pharmacology and identical selectivity without the proteins. And that is the thing what I wanted to point out. Someone should really go a little bit deeper in that, because from, from my idea, it's very important. Okay, uh, and thank you. And my second question in regards to the uh, BZ reaction, are you familiar with similar chemical oscillations that involve calcium in, in biological systems? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these cultural oscillations in, in cells, especially for example in oocytes, sites, are very well known. Uh, I, I have, don't have the details in mind. Uh, the theoretical description is identical. You see, this is one of the very general things. You can describe basically, you, <coughs> let's make a fair statement about Hodgkin Huxley. It was the other way around. Hodgkin Huxley described, uh, invented, or I don't know, constructed a set of three differential equations. And when you use them free of mechanism, you can describe the world by these three equations. Very simple. The problem is not the equations. The problem, the problem is when you put in the mechanism. And that means you easily can describe these calcium waves or these calcium oscillations using this formalism. No problem. But again, you have the problem, what is the mechanism? And this is, I think, the main discussion here.